Hi, Katie. You okay? Hello. Hello. Yes. It's John. Hello, I'm Harry Robinson, and this is the All Out Attack podcast. We won't start with that, don't we? I'll, I'll make sure. Oh, there he's coming. There we go. Hi. Hi, John. Hello. <laughs> My guest today is Katie Morgan Davis, a woman born into the Workers' Institute of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought, a communist cult based in South London that enslaved her, indoctrinated her, and kept her inside for the first 30 years of her life with no understanding or exposure to the outside world. <laughs> Hello, Scouser. Hi, Joe. I've, uh, I'll, tr- I'll try and tone down the Scouse accent if you want. No, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> All part of our lives. It's wonderful. Her father was Aravindan Balakrishnan, the despotic cult leader, and her mother, Sean Davis, a brainwashed cult member. Though her parents... They told their daughter that she was a test tube baby with no mother, father, or relatives. You know, if I think Katie saying something and it might need, you know, she, it, you might get a bit fuller picture. I might, you know, just say, Katie, what about whatever? You know? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Well, and, and I mean, if you, if you feel like you don't need to jump in, you know, much, you know, enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Accompanying us on the call is John Hales, a man Katie describes as her real father who has life stories to tell in his own words. Can I just say, John, as well, I proper idolise your pipe. I've been thinking about it. That, that came across <laughs> wrong, as in like your smoking pipe. Equipped with a microphone, access to a friend's premium Zoom account and a lockdown laissez-faire hairstyle, I sat down with a woman who is the embodiment of resilience and compassion. I hope you enjoy the Workers' Institute of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. What was that cult about? It was an extreme um, left-wing sect, which basically, um, shall we say, it morphed into a cult of personality of my father. Your father being, for context... Uh, my uh, father, Aravind and Balakrishnan. Um, a B, as he's also known in the, in the cult. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you think back to him now, do you think of him as your father, or do you think of him as A B, or does it not really um, make a difference? Um, I think no, I, I joke that he's I was my sperm donor. That's what I kind of joke. Because <laughs> my real father is John. Yeah. Well, I I wanted to. Uh, yeah, when we spoke just before the, the podcast, I think the kind of love that you can that you see in that relationship with you and John is very evident. Uh, I think especially when you were, I think something I found so wholesome was when you were showing me the uh, the teddy bears that John had bought you when you, you'd gone down to, I can't remember where you said you'd gone down to, but you'd bought, I feel Went free to- to London, to, yeah. Yeah, went down to London and bought proper teddy bears. Do you feel, obviously, be, being in the cult and being uh, stuck inside for, for so long, essentially, without the permission of, of AB to, to leave, do you feel now you've left, you're kind of reclaiming some of that childhood in the sense that, you know, you and John going down and buying teddy bears and that kind of stuff? Do you feel like I you... Suppose- yeah. That was kind of the idea for it was like what I had missed out on. John wanted to give me what I had missed out on. We were in London and and uh, it was Christmas mm-hmm. and she dealt with the crowds. You imagine it's a few years earlier, you know, you imagine Christmas is bad for everybody. There are angels in the street and Katie, one of the books, series of books she could read was Harry Potter. And that was a, in Hamley's all at the end, kids, Hamley Potter. We swept in and she bought a gorgeous original teddy bear. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, Harry Potter for you was a a kind of imaginary solace almost in terms of the, the world of Harry Potter. Why do you think that was? Or why do you um, think you could relate to Harry Potter as much as you did? Well, when when he grew up, he was unwanted by everybody around him. And I remember him 
saying that he was craving for even a single letter to be addressed to him. And that is how, kind of how I used to feel when growing up, because I was not meant to be living there and no one knew that I existed. So there was never a letter, not, not, not an official letter. There was no letters from even relatives of, of my father and mother and things like that, because I didn't even kind of know they were my parents. And it was, nobody knew I existed. So in that sense, and I used to dream that something would happen to take me away from there and that I could be somewhere else where it wasn't the way it was. And I kind of really connected with that aspect of Harry's life. That, that makes a lot of sense. Did you ever feel, because obviously you did have, you know, it was it was a normal house in Brixton house, wasn't it? So you were allowed to look outside and see the outside world passing you by and see kids playing. I mean, you were telling me about the swing set that was that was out in front of mm. one of the houses. Well, I wasn't happened. actually allowed to, to be fair. I was not. I was told I wasn't allowed to look out, and I often got beaten up for looking out of the window. Really? And really? yeah, but I still did where where I could. I used to sneak looks out of the window because I mean it was just so boring all the time in the house and and it just I just kind of looked even though it used to make me sad when I looked and saw what other people were having that I was not it still I was still kind of constantly drawn to looking out of the window all the time what do you think the children <laughs> looking in thought about you well to be fair, I was encouraged not to let them see me. And I was kind of frightened that if they saw me, they might tell they might tell my dad or one of the other cult members that I had been looking, you know, not, not to report me, but to kind of say, oh, I didn't realize there's a kid there or something. And then I would get beaten up for having shown myself. And then someone would be, if that was to have happened, I think somebody would be sort of, keeping an eye on me every minute of the day. And they pretty much did, but sometimes because whoever it was kind of eased off on their constant surveillance. And that's when I got a chance to, to look out. But if, if for some reason someone had mentioned that they had seen me, then that whoever was with me would have been tasked to keep up that surveillance constantly and so I was kind of afraid to show myself in case in case it got back to them yeah. that I was doing something I was not meant to be doing. I think the idea of because you're talking about you know constantly being surveyed you know especially by members of the collective I think you've talked a lot about um Sean uh your mother being one of the most stringent ones in terms of saying if you've done anything wrong and that kind of stuff and we can get to that later on if you want or, or if yeah. you don't want as well but the, the what, what i find strange is that not strange might be the wrong word the in a lot of cults or collectives or, or religious sects or that kind of stuff the kind of camaraderie between the people of this shared ideology is what keeps them together and it's like they're outcasted from the rest of the society but at least we have each other in this cult. Whereas for you, you're outcast from society essentially, but everyone is also trying to get one over on everyone else, it seems, by you know, snitching to A, B if you do anything wrong. Do you feel like that was the, the atmosphere in the, in the collective? Absolutely, that was the prevailing atmosphere all the time growing up. And basically everybody hated every, everybody else. That was the that was the bottom line. And the only time I ever saw two cult members getting along was when they were planning how to destroy a third cult member. Really? Yeah. If they were plotting, two of them would plot together to, to report a third one. And then they would sort of exchange notes and then they would get a bit chummy for a while, but only for the purpose of pinning down a third person. And obviously that changed and changed who it was. It was different cult members at different times. 
So if it was, say, this this particular person X, mm -hmm. it was the if it was the turn of person X to be targeted, then everybody else would be gung ho and all excited, reporting and adding adding to the list of crimes that person X committed, and isolating person X. And then that kind of, a few weeks later, person Y would get that, and then person X would be joining into the, in with the, with the crowd attacking mm. person Y. And I suppose there'll be revenge also for the previous attack on, on person X. And then it would just go back and forth like this. So it's all I remembered growing up. It was just terrible. Well, it's a toxic atmosphere. For absolutely. It. It's an absolutely toxic environment. And I was always scared all the time of of getting it, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and they also used to try to involve me in it and tell me that I should say something horrible to whoever it was. And sometimes and I really regret that I did do it when growing up because I didn't really know. Something about it made me feel really uncomfortable. I kind of didn't know what else to do. And sometimes I went along with it and I feel really disgusted that I did, even though I was just a little kid. I mean, I hate that I went along with that sort of thing, but it always felt wrong. Do you ever think about the fact that as someone, I mean, I mean, because you'll, you'll see it with anyone who's, I mean, I'm sure John will back me up with this being a former social worker, but people who've, who've grown up with trauma often kind of see that trauma as the right the, the right way of living or you know the normal way of living say um do you do you sometimes think back about the fact that everyone in that collective bar you was an adult who joined in adulthood uh and were brainwashed or or you know really you know, committed to this belief system and to this hatred and toxicity yeah but then you you're born into it so really you should be almost the most extreme out of all of them yet you are the most caring and, and anti-violence and do you, do you know what i mean like you you harbored that kind of pushing back away from the the negativity that they were pushing do you ever think about that and why you yourself maybe rejected those values of the cult um I don't know. I don't know exactly why. I, but I mean, later on, I definitely give credit to the fact that I did a lot of reading, and that inspired me to see that there's a, there's a different way of doing things. But mm -hmm. even when I was a kid, I mean, I didn't re hadn't done any reading at that time. But I just felt that this was not right. And also, another thing that I found was, like, my dad used to say things. He used to actually say, be kind to people or things like that. And then what he never practiced what he preached mm -hmm. and like, none of them did. So what they were kind of saying and what they were kind of trying to tell me and their behavior was completely at variance. And that I found really difficult. It was like, you were telling me to be kind, but then this is not kind. This is horrible. Yeah. You know, and I I found that sort of dissonance really, really strange. Do you, as well. do you, so you had to, in the mornings, one of the main things you had to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, was take notes of your father's sermons or kind of like his talks in the morning, his lectures. What kind of mm -hmm. things was he... Oh, because obviously, he was, you know, you're talking about him saying he'd be kind to each other and then not showing that. What kind of things was he was he preaching? Oh, it was endless, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't remember taking a lot of notes myself, but the other cult members used to take notes and then I used to have to, like, write them out or mm -hmm. something yeah. like that. And we were encouraged to keep a diary all the time about everything that was going on. Was that diary private uh, or...? No, nothing was ever private. I mean, later on, when I, like in my mid-teens, I did used to keep things private and sort of keep them in a, I used to call it a not-to-look-at file and keep things private in there. 
-hmm. So we have to come back to that later. Don't forget yeah. to come back to that point later. Otherwise, we're going to go off at the tangent. <laughs> <laughs> the so, yes. Well, his sermons were basically about how he ruled the world and how everything was related to him. So, like, if there was a natural disaster in another country, he used to say that that was related to the fact that the landlord phoned to demand payment of rent because very often he used to refuse to pay his rent because he was he said he was going on a rent strike against the British fascist state so <laughs> and he wouldn't pay the rent so then the landlord would ring up and say oh your rent payment hasn't come through something like that and then he and then there would be a earthquake somewhere or another and then he'd say that is because the fascist state has been is targeting AB's communist collective. So, so his invisible machine has has caused this earthquake to warn the fascist state that you carry on like this, you're going to be ripped to shreds or well, whatever. Well, just, just to touch on the invisible machine, because the invisible machine was called Jackie, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, which uh, stands for was it Jehovah Allah? Oh, I, I can't, sorry, Christ. I can't, Christ, yeah, Christ, Krishna, um, and Immortal Iswaran. Mm -hmm. And could could you? I mean, because I, I I was reading up about Jackie, because everything seems very vague about Jackie in terms of. I, I watched a Josie, one of the members of the cult, essentially try and explain it, and it wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. A, a, you know, things weren't clear after she'd explained it, but. Uh, yeah, what was Jackie? It was meant to be my dad's um, mind control machine, mm -hmm. which he said it was an invisible machine, and we could we couldn't see it, so you can't sort of say, "Oh, that Jackie's over there" or something like that. It was you could we couldn't see Jackie, but that he was he said he was kind of everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And and that he had control over everything in it, and he used to he used to compare it to the Matrix um, films, and say that it was Jackie was like in control in that way, and everything was kind of in the Matrix. So, and that Jackie answered to him, mm -hmm. and. If he was upset about something, Jackie would go and destroy things. Or... Was, was Jackie the thing that was essentially keeping the cult inside through fear? I think that was, yes, I think there was a lot of that going on. Yes, there were two things that I can think of. One was Jackie and the other was about the fascist state, you know, that the fascist state is outside and they're just waiting to come in and destroy everything and kill all of us and all these things. So we have to stick together to stay safe from the fascist state. And on the other hand, there was Jackie, which would, if we went against, um, I'm not going to call him my dad anymore because my dad's John. I'm going to call him AB, okay? If we yeah. went against yeah. AB in any way, Jackie would um, destroy us or, would make us sick and uh, there were times when like I disagreed with AB about something or another and then I got the worst cold in, of my life and that was meant to have been mm -hmm. Jackie punishing me for daring to disagree with AB. Well it's worth clarifying as well that you were, oh, you not you were, you are type 1 diabetic but you weren't That's diagnosed right. until you left the cult you know, 30 years yeah. at the age of 30. Yeah. So, I mean, the kind of ups and, you know, as someone with, with the type one diabetic in my immediate family, the highs and lows and the, the illnesses that come along with that, especially if it's untreated. I mean, you, it's very easy to believe as well as being indoctrinated into the cult, that all of this is to do with Jackie. I feel bad because AB has done this because I, you know, didn't take the washing out or something. Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah. But in time, I realized that this was 
stupid but when I was a little kid I kind of I didn't know anything else so I believed in it but as time went on I realized that things kind of didn't tally what what he said and he'd say something one day and something else the next day or even the same day he'd say completely contradictory things about how how the world was how the world worked or how how things were meant to be or whatever and everybody else used to just sort of swallow it whole and not ask any questions but I used to kind of think hang on a minute I, that doesn't kind of tally it doesn't make sense and if I don't think I ever I'm not sure I ever dared to raise it but I could just imagine what would have happened if I had dared to raise it it was like we don't question we don't ask questions he knows everything so if he says it was if he says he even used to say things like if I say black is white then Jackie would make black white and if I say night is day night will be day mm -hmm. so yeah. it was like you know did do you think that the the other the the because it was it was all was it it was all women in the call wasn't it in the collective obviously bar a b do you think all the yeah. other women had some form of stockholm syndrome in terms of yeah definitely yes well there was a there was a man who was he didn't visit he didn't i mean sorry let me say that again he didn't live in the collective but he used to visit and he had a car and he used to visit and i, I don't know if he had whether he was um i don't know he seemed a bit he seemed vulnerable if you know yeah. what i mean and i think they just used him and he was the sort of person who was susceptible to being told anything mm -hmm. sort of thing and they kind of took yeah. advantage so, of uh going back to what you're saying before about the the you know the privacy kind of violations especially as a as a uh, a young girl you know developing into a woman and that kind of stuff how much does that violation of privacy affect you mentally growing up it was absolutely mortifying all the time and i was always trying to hide things and then another thing was i wasn't allowed to be ill so if i had like had a diarrhea or something which i always used i used to have because there was so much stress all the time so i was always poorly with my uh, with my stomach always having some sort of tummy ailment and and then i used to have to try to hide the fact that i was yeah i was yeah. not well and another another Thing, which carried on until I left the cult actually was that there was so there were not many bathrooms sometimes there was one bathroom some places I lived in there were one bathroom and sometimes there were two but very often it was always occupied and if if you have if you're having a poorly tummy it could be it could I could have accidents a number of times I had accidents just waiting to use the, the loo you know and that kind of thing it was just unbelievably embarrassing well and then that, that's kind of a cycle of if you're you know if you're having accents or whatever or showing that you're not well yeah then that doesn't fit into ab's remit does it yeah it was, yeah that's right it didn't fit into his remit because it meant that you were not following him properly and he used to say if you if you were ill focus on him and you will get better and that's what everybody used to tell me if i was ill it was like focus on a b and then you will get better and obviously as time went on i just thought that was ridiculous but you were not allowed to see a doctor or anything like that if something if something was wrong and then back to the privacy mm -hmm. it was it was so mortifying and so i lived in constant fear really of of people sometimes people would just walk into the room when i was getting undressed or into the toilet or yeah that sort yeah. of thing you know and you were not you were not expected to protest or anything it, it, it's it, it's very much a kind of culture of obedience and and kind of 
you know, stepping on people and keeping them feeling very small. Because if you're constantly at fear yeah. of an invasion of privacy, you're not, you know, mentally strong to disobey someone's, you know, cult teachings, are you? Yeah. And then when I remember when I was in my teens, or well, actually before I, I became a teenager, around 11, when I was developing um, curbs and mm -hmm. signs of puberty, it was meant, he said that it was because I had done bad things that this happened. And when I got my first period, it was because I had become, I was a bad person that I had <laughs> fallen into being a woman or something like that. Well, I think, you know, as someone with sisters, I, I know that that's a such a, a a scary and uncertain thing for for girls anyway when that first happens and you're unsure why it's happening or whatever so to have that kind of negative affirmation uh to say yeah this is the worst thing ever instead of kind of reassuring you that this is natural is surely crippling mentally yes it was and and i was meant to feel ashamed of of like having large breasts and being cur curvy so I had to wear like sacks you know something which would, didn't show my shape at all because he was terrified that somebody or another would look at me and feel get attracted to me or whatever and he, he remember him telling me when I was 13 that nobody would ever be attracted to me because I'm so ugly and then and that kind of that even to this day I still have issues around that yeah, I can imagine. It's so, hard. yeah. So I had to wear sacks because he didn't, I don't know, you see, again, nothing kind of tallied. Because on one hand, I was so ugly that nobody would be attracted to me. And then on the other hand, I had to wear a sack so that nobody would get attracted to me. Yeah. So yeah. how does that make like, any sense? You're like dressed in rags. Yeah. Well, it, it's, a, it's a form of kind of visual oppression, isn't it? Yeah. Do yeah. you, do, at, at that point, at that age, did you know, so I don't think we've mentioned actually, did you know that AB was your sperm donor or biological father by then? Um, no, but I, I think I kind of guessed it deep down because it was like, who else was there? And I know that there was no, there was no other man around. So when I read about things that about fathers and mothers and things, I just assumed he, he was like my father, but I didn't, understand the mechanics of how it worked obviously because all that was kept mm. hidden from me in terms of because obviously the, the and the whole outside world was hidden from you and the the kind yeah. of societal societal norms and the, the basics of society but obviously you, you talked about how you you had multiple houses that you lived in and there were there were a couple of times where you left uh you you had to leave the house for various things what went on when you had to leave the house say when moving into another house or or going out for a day um well i was i was never left to like just go with one person or something it was like a military operation to keep me um hidden and what they call keeping me safe but there was normally two or three people at least um chaperoning me around and the only times that I was allowed to go out was when somebody came to the house who they didn't want to know that I existed like a relative of my stepmother's or something or another and that was once a year or maximum twice a year but I do remember I think when I was from the age of eight till the age of 10, I, did, I don't think I even went out at all. I just stayed in the house all day long, all day, all month, all year, nonstop. Does that have a, a, a physical implication or like in, in terms of not being able to get enough vitamin D and that kind of stuff? Yeah, yes, I've had a lot of health problems related to, to what happened. Even now I struggle to walk properly and that sort of thing, brittle bones and different yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, th uh, going on to 
leave, it, it, staying on to leave in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time at the age of around, was it eight that you ran away from the home? Is that right? Oh, no, no, sorry. Not when I was eight. It was, was I was 20, eight. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was in my 20s, early 20s. 20s. And, yeah. Oh, okay. Apologies about that. So when you yeah. were in your 20s, you ran away from the home. Yeah. Uh, could you talk me through what happened? Or what, what, firstly, what brought you to, bring, you know, to go and leave the home? And then well, what again, it was, you? yeah, it was because of the hate that was going on. Like my dad was so hateful of everybody. I mean, not my dad, AB, was so hateful of everybody around. And all the rest of the people in the house were also so full of hate all the time. So like when, not long before that, well, sorry, about, about I'm trying to get my dates right. Well, just less than four years before that, when the 9-11 incident happened, they were all celebrating about the people being killed and things like that, you know, and I just found that unbelievably bad, even though I knew that they were like that. And all my life I had grown up with them celebrating people being killed and hating the West and hating anything to do with being kind or being good. Um, while saying being be kind, but then hating everything that is like liberalism and democracy and human rights, anything to do with that, they hated it. But even then I kind of, it kind of really hit me when 9-11 happened and the, their attitude to that, I thought it was just despicable. And then as time went on, I just couldn't deal with all the hate, hatred that was going on. And I remember my dad was, I mean, AB, sorry, was full of hate about neighbors very often. And there was some, there was a, um, I'm not sure where they were from, but they were, they were black people. And he used to call them using the N word and things like that about black people and really horrible and nasty about the, this family. And then everybody else in the house was saying, yes, these people are evil fascist agents and things like that. And, you know, I just thought, you know, I don't want to hear any more of this. I don't want to hear this sort of hateful nonsense anymore. I don't want to be part of this sort of shit anymore. I just want to, I want to be with decent people or not with anybody at all, you know, kind of. And, and I thought to my, I looked at myself in the mirror and thought, you know, I'm going to leave this place. I just can't deal with this nonsense anymore. Just go mad. And just not long before that, I'd had a dream that I was, I had become a really bad person. So in the dream, I managed, I was um, finally managed to get out of the cult and I walked up to someone and they looked at me with absolute horror. And I wondered why did they look at, why did this person look at me with horror? And, and then I turned around and looked at my reflection in the, in the front door of the place I had just left. And I saw the witch king from the Lord of the Rings looking back at me with a horrible face, a long face and long thin hairs and shriveled up like that. And that kind of woke me up to thinking that, you know, I'm if I stay here for much longer, I'm going to become like them. And I'm going to become mm -hmm. like a like witch king, you know. It's like I'm wearing the ring and slowly turning into witch king. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I really have to get out of this before I, I become like them. Sure. And I was also being angry all the time, angry towards other people in the house and things like that. And I, I, I hated what I was becoming. And also hating, hating AB, hating everybody in the house. And I kind of thought, even though they would probably think that they deserve to be hated, but the fact that I was feeling those emotions, which I thought were very ugly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just didn't want to be that person. So I thought I had to get out of there. What, 
what happened in the moments leading up to you going? So was was AB out of the house at that point then? In terms um, of in terms no, of you you running away the first time, not like acting, not running away at the age of thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yes. What yeah. happened was, I started packing a packing bags, and put all my writings in it and some some clothes and things like that, and I kind of hid it away. But then Josie found it and then told Bala that it looks like I'm trying to run away. So as if I'm packing to run away. So he called me in. I thought, oh, my God, now they're going to realize that I'm trying to run away. So I made up a story and basically said, oh, no, I love this place. Why would I want to leave? And, and I butted him up, gave him a lot of gave him a lot of, what shall we say, praise and things. And he always, yeah. he always melted if he was praised. And because he, he, he was a, he was a narcissist, you know, who always loved lots of praise. So if you praised him, he kind of got off your back, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I sort of said, oh no, why would I ever want to do that? And he kind of thought, mm, probably not. And then he told Josie, oh, don't, don't, don't interfere. She's clearly not wanting to leave. I thought, oh my God. So that now I can leave, but I have to wait an extra couple of weeks. What happened as you, like the, the day you left then? Yeah, well, well, Josie and Aisha, two of the cult members had gone out shopping and they were going out I think they were going not in not locally, but a little bit further, and they used to do that every every other Monday. So I thought that I had a bit more time to run away without them coming back and catching me. And also, uh, my dad used to, I mean, AB used to have a bath in the morning. So at that point, there was, it felt like there was not too many people around. So I thought when he goes into the bath and they go out, I will make my escape. And I did. How far did Carry you all these yeah. huge, enormous bags. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just interjecting because we went to the flat, Harry, where, and she explained to me, we went down the road and I, all the plastic bags, she was dragging along the street and that, you know because she wouldn't leave her, her notes, which obviously the book she wrote from, yeah. because they were so important to her. She wasn't going to let her story die. Yeah. Which is fantastic. I mean, it's a good job that those notes, you know, survived. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Both but what did you, so how far did you get then? Oh, it was awful because, because I hadn't really, done anything much carrying wise it was like oh my arms were killing me carrying all these heavy bags and it was like what do I do now how I've got all these grand ideas of going somewhere but what on earth do I do I don't even know how to do anything I'm just walking down the road and I don't know what what to do so I stopped a few couple of people and said oh I've run away from home and I think they just thought I was a I don't know whatever I suppose they thought I was just being funny or something but I don't think they clearly didn't realize what exactly was going on but one man who I who saw me carrying this bag said do you need some help and I kind of said I've run away from home so he said why don't you go to the police station and then it was like how do I get there I have no idea so he tried to give me directions and obviously because I was never I never had gone out on my own I had no idea how to get there, but then I stopped a few people along the way and asked them, how do I get there? And finally I managed to get there, which was good. And what did they say but, when you got there? Um, it was a bank holiday, unfortunately. So there wasn't, I think there wasn't, um, I was hoping to be able to get somewhere to live, you know, like a flat or something like that. but. Because everything was closed, they saw, somebody said that you probably have to sleep on the street for tonight, and then um, tomorrow start looking around for somewhere to live. 
and obviously I, I didn't I didn't know what to say and I didn't want to say anything to get get the cult members into trouble I just wanted to all I wanted was to be free I didn't want to discipline anybody else or punish anybody else all I wanted was just to be out of there and be free so I didn't tell them about what was actually going on about the level of violence and how I'd never been allowed to go out and all that I just kind of framed it as that th my parents are extremely strict and not giving me any any chance to go out and do things yeah so they thought the best way was to call my parents i mean a b and the others and and sort of like i don't know what what's the right word for it but set up a meeting where we talk things through mm -hmm. and and then they would say that i was so I hold on with a cough <coughs> that i should be given a bit more freedom or whatever and they thought it was something which could could be an agreement could be reached through discussion and i stupidly thought maybe now that the police were involved as uh, because he was terrified of the police that maybe he would listen yeah and yeah. maybe i would get a bit more freedom so and I, I just didn't know what to do so they said maybe go back and then tomorrow start again and then um go go along and sign on for for benefits or something like that and go to the shop whatever and i kind of thought didn't really think it through and thought maybe maybe now that the police were involved and maybe they realized how much i disliked the way things were maybe they would help me and obviously once i i stupidly went back and and then they my ab beat me up and kept telling me what a traitor i was and all these things for wanting to go away I don't call. <coughs> Sorry, funny no. love with coughing. No, that's absolutely fine. Absolutely. So much. Is that house that I escaped from? Mm -hmm. It was a damp house. It was extremely damp, and where I lived. And ever since then, I've had a horrible cough. Really? Yes. Do you feel so? Obviously, you, you came back then and were vilified by the the cult members and ab do yeah. you feel that that kind of gave you the taste for for the outside world considering that was almost yeah the but the, what i learned most of all was that i do not know how to do anything at that point because i had no clue how to get anywhere and when i was in the police station i rang some numbers which i had written down before leaving for for like a refuge or something like that and i rang the number and asked them would i be able to like would you be able to give me somewhere to stay or something like that and they kind of, some one person said you might be able to but you'd have to take a bus and a tube and things to get there and then i suddenly realized you know i don't know how to do any of that i've had you been did you know what the bus and the tube were from being in the house? Yes. Well, on the occasions when I went out, when the when when my stepmother's relatives visited, I had got on the bus and on the tube, but I never learnt what to do. Was I just was told to like don't look around, just get on and just like look at the back of of AB's anorak and just follow him around. So I kind of and. I was never shown how to do anything and I just didn't didn't know how to do it. And obviously because I had stayed in the house so much, when I went out, I just felt so overwhelmed that I I couldn't make sense of anything anywhere. It was just such an assault on the senses on the on the rare occasions I went out that I I just kind of didn't know. I didn't even follow or learn how to do anything. Well, it's a completely different world, isn't it? It's a complete, yeah. it, I mean, it, almost in a very literal sense. That yeah. It's, it's something you've never experienced. In, yeah. So that was, was that your early 20s then when, when that? Uh, yes, first, I was first, um, 22. So 
I mean, there were, you know, around eight years between that and the escape with the, with, with your, your proper escape, sorry. Were, was AB on edge at any point in that time, knowing full well that you wanted to leave? Um, well, yeah, he was kind of, he used to keep bringing it up. Mm -hmm. And, but I think he was, he was a bit worried as well. So he started saying I could go to the laundrette with them once a week and things like that. So I did get to go out a little bit more because I think he wanted to ensure that I, I didn't do something similar again. So I got a tiny little bit more freedom, but a lot more hatred as well. Does that not contribute? Oh, sorry. Yeah. What, what you saying? Sorry. I, I was going to say, does that not contribute to even more kind of want to be outside? Yeah, definitely. I just wish that I hadn't gone back, but it was like I also, though I desperately wanted to go, I also knew I was so disabled that I wasn't able to go. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought maybe, maybe it's kind of just to let me stay here because I just don't know how to don't know how to navigate anything myself and there's no there didn't seem to be any way to help me to and no one that I knew who could help me to learn the things that I had at had this at this point now at, at this point now uh it's because it's worth mentioning as well that Sean who was in the the cult was your yeah what biological mother? I mean, please stop me if you're not willing to talk about. No, no, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Was she still around at this point? No, no, she passed away when I was fourteen. Did you have an inkling that she was your mother before? Yes. Then? Yeah, I kind of thought she was my mother, but I did ask a few times. Mm -hmm. Not, not her so much, but other the other cult members and I was always told not to ask such questions. Well she so. was she was the according to you she was the, the strictest uh I mean I think in your in your words that you said that she's kind of compensating for the fact that because she, you're her daughter she wants yeah. to show her loyalty to A B by dobbing you in it every time you did something that wasn't that's right. Before. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's what it was like. She was, she was not. She was. She was never a mother to me. She was very unkind, and I grew up hating her. Honestly. What was the feelings when, um, she, she died? She, she I mean, for for context. I, I mean, I'm not sure if you'd rather explain it or would you rather. Me? No, I, yeah, I'm happy to explain it. Well, she threw herself out of the window on Christmas Eve, 1996. And then re remained in hospital till she died on the 3rd of August, 1997. So to be fair, the, the main feeling I had when she, when she went to hospital was relief because I didn't know she was my mum and it just meant one less bully in the house. Mm -hmm. And also things got a lot better after she left because she, at first she wasn't there to dob me in all the time. And the fact that she was in hospital meant the rest of the cult members were also more, everybody else had a bit more to do and visiting her in hospital and this thing and that thing, that there was less surveillance on me. So I felt so much more free. How long was she in hospital for? If you don't mind. Um, eight months. Eight, she was in hospital for eight months. So how many times so, did you get to see her? Eight months from Christmas Eve 1996 to 3rd of August the next year. How many times did you get to see her in the hospital? Um, I think I went to visit her about eight times or so. And Wait. they were, I was always told I'm not to tell the nurses who I was and, mm -hmm. and that I was just visiting or something like that. There's obviously the the very important visit where you kind of took a leap of faith and and in your own way asked her if 
you uh, tried to seek confirmation that she was your mum. Could you explain to me yeah. that that kind of you know, what happened? Well, I, I, I didn't realise that what was going on and anything, but I I don't know. I just said, but, but when I was leaving on this occasion, I said bye bye, mummy to her, and then she looked up and she said bye bye, baby to me. And I was quite shocked about that because she never, never called me a baby like that or showed any, um, she never showed any, what shall we say, sign that I had, was anything to do with her, really. So when she called, said baby to me, that I was quite shocked about that and quite happy about it as well. Did that change your perspective of who... Sean was in terms of obviously before then all your memories of her uh, this you know um, woman who was out to make your life harder mm, and then after that she's of, your mum yeah I couldn't really make a lot of sense of it because obviously my dad was so angry that I had said that mm -hmm. and then that was actually the last time I ever saw her so and then she died a few months later and my dad, um, A.B., said to me that it was because I had said that, that Jackie had killed her because I had said bye-bye mummy to her. And so he sort of told me that her death was my fault. And I kind of, at that time, I kind of took it on board, I think. Even though I, at that, by that time, I kind of knew most of what he was saying was nonsense, but it was, it was quite a, what shall we say, um, What's it, what's it even to the be? air at that time and so much going on yeah or, sorry, so i kind of oh sorry there was a bit of a delay then um but to even oh, be a, to, even, to even to be accused of that even if you think that ab isn't you know telling the truth just to hear those words of uh, must affect you surely yeah and i just kept because he always he always used to say that i was a bad person and this was kind of like extra proof that I'm, I'm a bad person. And I kind of, I think I just took it on board. I'll, I'll go, I'll move on again to the, uh, to the period, what, what we were on, to, what, sorry, what we were talking about before. The, yeah. the about eight years between uh, your first attempt at an escape and your actual escape. You were talking about how you felt yeah. that it was probably better to stay at home because you weren't fit for the outside world. When did that mentality yeah. change for you? And you felt that kind of vigor to try and escape again? Well, all sorts of things happened. And then I I had a affair with somebody who was a neighbor and invited them into my flat through the window wow and that kind wow. of I, that was kind of the best thing that had ever happened to me at that time so that gave me hope that i should try to get out again because well let, let's go back and say what happened um obviously i was inviting this boy into my flat and they found him and then they locked all the doors and windows so that I can't go out at all or can't let him in and banished him from coming to the coming to the house. So that I was just so angry when that happened because for the first time in my life, I had a taste of what it was like to talk to someone who was not a freak, basically. Talk to someone who was nearer to my age and was not talking nonsense about Jackie and world domination and hatred and violence and all the nonsense that was talked in the house. It was the first time I'd actually had a conversation with, with a, just a, a human being who was just being human rather than being this weird cultish freakery, you know. So... So to lose that was very, very hard for me. And that kind of, I, when that happened, I thought, you know, I really, I must get out of here. I have to get out of here. And 
what age were you yeah. then in terms of the period in between the 25. two? 25. 25? Yeah, I was 25, yeah. Did the lads, how did the first interaction between you and him come about then? Did he see you through the window then or? Yeah, I mean, he was, he was living upstairs, two floors up, and I used to wave at him from the window. And, well, actually, I should say what happened earlier that year, which is 2008, I was, I'd had enough of what, everything that was going on, and I thought, I want to kill myself. And so on New Year's Day, I heard lots of fireworks, and I thought, you know, I want to just look at the fireworks once more before I die, because I'm not, I'm not won't be able to ever see fireworks again. So I want to look at the fireworks. And, and this lad came out and gave me a huge smile when he saw me. I think he was a little bit tipsy. And when he saw me, he gave a huge smile. And I mean, nobody ever smiled at me or anything like that. And this lad, the way he looked at me was like as if I was worth worth smiling at, if that makes sense. And that made me want to carry on living. So I fell in love with him, obviously. And, and then all this started later on in the year. Did you ever reconnect with him after the initial, after the, he was banished from the house and you escaped? Um, yeah, well, the, of the, um, on the last year, 2013, before I escaped, I started writing to him again and telling him what had happened. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other oh, sorry. thing, um, Katie got pregnant from the boy. Oh. That's right. And the father beat her up and she lost the baby. She had, uh, you know, a miscarriage. Yes, yes, well, that I'm happened as well. I'm so sorry to hear that. I didn't... I, I didn't yeah. know that. Did how does that play on your mind? Whilst because I mean, obviously, you went from a, a massive low mentally and and wanting yeah. to take your own life, and then this boy yeah. comes in and saves saves you essentially. Saves my life. life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does having something you know tremendously sad happen, like like a miscarriage, does that then put you in the same kind of low period and the same kind yeah. of mentality yeah. well kind of yes but then i always thought to myself you know now that i've met somebody outside i mean i didn't think it was going to be like a long-term thing but it was just the fact that there was some connection with the outside world it i just thought you know i can't i cannot kill myself until i tell this boy what what actually happened and that I didn't choose not to see him but that I was not allowed to see him and what what AB said was that he's going to tell the police that the boy was a burglar if I if I carried on trying to see him so and he and the boy was black and I knew what happened to black a lot of black young black men in mm -hmm. police custody mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of terrible things have happened. And I kind of thought, I, I don't want to be responsible for that, you know, so I better just stay away. After you've not been able to see this boy at the age of 25, it's a, obviously five or so years later when your yeah. escape happens. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Pardon are, me. You, are you able to talk me through, again, the run up to you escaping properly and what brought it about? Yes. Um, well, I kind of, I think one of the things was I wanted to see him again, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the most important thing. I mean, by then I'd kind of, there were other things going on and I was losing weight rapidly as well. So I knew I had to get out of there because something was not right and I was very ill. So from to be fair, even before that, I kind of wanted to get out because I was so angry with them for having taken away the one thing that the first time I'd ever really been happy in my life and they snatched that away. And I was just so angry, you know, and I just couldn't carry on. So I 
try to think of ways to get out of there and and i i started working on josie and um because she was getting bullied by my stepmother all the time and she was getting getting quite irritated herself about how things were because she was being bullied all the time and my ab was always defending my stepmother when yeah and she was being bullied by my stepmother awfully bullied by her and josie tried to because josie believed in ab so much she tried to tell ab about what was going on and ab just used to beat her up and defend his wife so i think she started getting quite disenchanted with what was going on in the house as well um so i basically started working on her and saying that ab is not a bad person because she would never accept that ab was a bad person but that he was like like the father in snow white or something who was under a spell by his evil wife and that's why i'm being treated in the way i'm being treated and why i'm not allowed to go out and all those things and and so well josie kind of believed that because also because my stepmother had been so evil to her so it kind of made sense to her and i made sure i never said that i think ab was just as guilty so i just made it all about my stepmother and josie obviously was quite jealous of my stepmother because she wanted to be ab's wife so i played on that and i know i i kind of manipulated her and i i do feel a bit guilty sometimes that i i did that but it was kind of that or i die so you know i had to i had to what do you call it do what i had to do yeah, to, needs must. to get free yeah it needs must exactly but so in the end josie agreed to help me to escape and this was after uh because your was it your stepmom had had diabetes and this is also after you kind of was it seen a pamphlet and clocked on that yeah maybe that's right and i thought maybe i'm having diabetes but there was no proof but i knew i was very ill mm -hmm. so i remember saying to josie i can't remember when it was sometime in the middle of 2013 i said that i'm going to be out of this house by the end of 2014 either either i'm going to be out as a free person or i'm going to be out in a coffin so and i i kind of meant I, I wasn't sure that I was dying, but I kind of meant that I would kill myself if I'm not, if I can't get out of here because I'm not staying here anymore. I just absolutely am not going to put up with this anymore. Even if I'm, even if I'm not suited to the outside world or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I'm just not going to carry on staying here anymore. It's just, I can't deal with it. So, so I think Josie was realized how serious I was about it and she also was worried about my weight that I was losing weight constantly and like kind of losing half a stone every couple of weeks even though I was eating like a horse so I think she she knew something was wrong so she she sneaked in a, a few mobile phones one for herself, one for me, and one for Aisha. And then when they were out, when AB and his wife were out, she she rang, she rang around, rang the number that we had that we had seen on, on the television in a news item about forced marriages. Mm -hmm. And what did they say? And well, the, the, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in that because I, was, I didn't know how to speak on the phone, but Josie kind of arranged with them to send someone along to come and get us. Mm -hmm. So the arrangement was made for the 25th of October when Ibi and his wife were, were going out and a car was arranged to come at 11.15 in the morning. 
and no. so we started doing packing pack, made packed everywhere even before this i was already planning this so i had already started packing over the months three or two to three months before that already started doing a lot of packing so we might yeah. finally managed to get everything all my writings and everything that was important to me managed to get all of that and and 11 15 uh, 20, on the 25th of october is when you made your escape yes ma made my escape what with was, josie. was it with, with josie and uh aisha um yeah, well aisha had to stay behind because um my stepmother's sister was disabled and she couldn't she couldn't have been left in the house on her own mm -hmm. so the idea yeah. was that we would go first and then later on maybe call for Aisha. What was your first taste of freedom? If that's well, I couldn't, couldn't honestly couldn't believe that it was real. But I was really happy at the idea that we had finally I'd finally managed to get out of there. But I was also very ill, so I don't think I I don't think I appreciated it as much as I could have and I was also quite numb to everything that was going on where did they because it was a, obviously it was a forced marriage as charity or a refuge kind of charity where did yeah. they take you from the so it took us up to Leeds oh so all, all the straight away all the way up yeah to Leeds. that that day itself yes and and you've been in Leeds ever since that's that right day. yes okay yeah obviously with you know the wonderful John. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I met John in 2015 campaigning for Labour Party. That's how I met John. And then he introduced me to the Amnesty International. Well, the and thing was, I um, I think I said before, but we were campaigning and um, she said she uh, was um, in Leeds because she had an abusive father but she couldn't go into detail. It was subject to a court case and she was living in a hostel. And I could sense that she was a bit lost in the hostel. You know, she didn't know what, what was happening. She had no friends and that. And I, I did work for Amnesty and I knew they were nice people. So I said, we meet every month on a Thursday at the Civic Hall. So I suggested, and do you know what? I went to the meeting and there she was! <laughs> Why? Yeah. How lovely! And then the full story came out. You know, mm -hmm. um, when the court case took place, isn't it? Then then you, yes. Prison and that. And, um, and then we've got closer and closer ever since. And... Honestly, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I, I think it's, yeah. you know, I, I think a lot of... Uh, there, there'll be a lot of people who, when they hear the story for the first time, you know, don't hear uh, all the fantastic... Obviously, you know, once it gets to you escaping, people go, oh, that's like the end of the story, but it's not. It's, you know, John. Yeah. Uh, yes. you, know, you and John as a, as a duo. <laughs> well, I mean, she's... Of course, we moved on, you know. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's in the second year of her degree. And... Well, she's the same same level as me. Yeah. Same level as you from no yeah. education. I mean, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's absolutely thank strange. you. Because I mean, we're going through airports now. We've taken her on holiday, as I said, and Vienna on our own. And I mean, and from not being able to use a smartphone, if I'd have been in Vienna on my own, I wouldn't have got in the bloody flat because I'm not good at smartphones. So she got me in the flat. From being in class, they did a few years. She learned so quick. Oh, oh I mean, I, that's. I, I think that's evident from the fact that, you know, you were you were being very bright and, and quick, despite being in a house where you were subject to no education, whatsoever. Um. In terms of. Uh, in terms of you. Just say, oh, sorry. Just to say quickly. Um, yeah. Which I think is important because. She was sort of accused of she couldn't get on a bus, she couldn't do this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 so they said, Oh, well, she 
you know, she's make up these stories, really. She's not really with it. She can't get on a bus and that. And they gave her an IQ test and she was one of 5%. A high I rem- IQ. I remember you telling me that. <laughs> that, that I, I mean, yeah. I, but I think that's evident from the fact that, what, I mean, I, I'm not sure how, when did you start your start your first qualifications? Um. Well, I, I had to start from bottom, really. I started with functional skills English in 2015 and maths in 2015. And then I started the GCSE in English 2016. And then... You got an A star. Yes. <laughs> that's higher than I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's... Yet to go from... I mean, what, what's that? Six In six years, you've gone from functional level like bare minimum skills yeah to second second year degree which is phenomenal yeah well yes I've, I've always loved reading and I and that was one of the things I used to do when I was stuck in the house I used to read non-stop I did lots of secret reading because I wasn't allowed to read except what he allowed me to read but I used to do a lot of reading in secret yeah. Everything, yeah. everything I could get my hands on, read, read, read nonstop. <laughs> he did have, uh, did have some really good books there. You yeah, know. he did. A but lot he was trying to that. impress people. Impress. He was trying to impress his followers and impress his brother who came from Singapore, who used to visit once a year, and things like that. So he he filled the house with books. He never really read them, and I obviously read them. So it's a godsend for you. I said to her, we were laughing one night. I said, What would you have done, Katie, if all he'd have collected was comics? Mm, yeah. <laughs> I said, you would have still made something of it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that that's a testament to the kind of narcissistic side of him that he just wants to fill his house with books that he's not going to read to yeah. show up. To, 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 look, to look good. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll I'll move away from AB because I, I don't I really want to end this on a positive note because your story, yeah. as much as it starts off harrowing, the point that you are yeah. now is overwhelmingly positive. But just to, to Thank put you. to put it and oh the, you know it it's so, I mean when I when I first had the the talk with you and every interview I've, I've ever seen of you has always come across as massively wholesome and you know a, a real glow comes off it. But anyway, the, to you. put to put a pin through through a b and 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 leave him where he is obviously to give context the court case happened and he was sentenced to 27 years for 23 years 23 years yeah. sorry yes for slave was it slavery uh child abuse and yeah. sexual assault yeah on a couple of other women yeah Not on me but on others yes of course yeah. but i mean you're, you're the child in question for the yes and false imprisonment mm-hmm Yep. Do if you could, I mean, obviously he's he's in prison now and he will be in prison for a very long time. If you could get a meeting with him, you know, in prison with the the bulletproof glass uh, wall in front of you, what would what would you say to him? I think no. I think what I would say to him was, unfortunately, you were never really my father, but my real father was waiting for me all this time. John. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> it's so lovely, really. I can't believe I've got a soul daughter. <laughs> I, would, I, I don't believe it either. <laughs> you've popped out, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what I wanted to ask, a very similar question, is you. I, when, I, when I spoke to you the other week, you made a very interesting point that I want to reiterate on this, which was that... Yeah when you came out and saw the world, a world that you hadn't been exposed to, you were in, in it locked up inside longing for love and affection and, and you weren't allowed to be given that love and affection, you weren't allowed to even be touched uh, unless it was by AB. Do you feel there's enough love and affection in the world at the moment? Not nearly enough, no. It's, everybody seems to be sort of wanting to punish other people and things like that. And I think it's just so ugly what I see. So much of that going, I mean, I know there's a lot of good going on in the world, but the ugliness is awful. 
I mean, I see a lot of what I thought I left behind in the cult. I see it out here in the world, the way people are unkind to one another and they don't forgive one another and they they judge people based on the worst things they've ever done and sort of reduce an entire human being to one or two wrong acts and forget that that person is a wholesome human being. And I, th I just think that is unbelievably ugly, you know, and I just can't understand how anybody can can behave in this way. It's just so, I actually, to be honest, I feel quite nauseated sometimes and feel like I haven't truly left the cult when I see the nastiness going on in the world. And I see people wanting to punish other people and hating other people and sort of judging other people. And, you know, there's just, there's just not enough kindness and I just can't, can't believe it really. Was it a shock to you when you came out that? Oh, sorry, there's a bit of echo there. Was there was it a shock to you when you came out that that kindness wasn't there? Did you have an image of the outside world? I thought it was a lot kinder than than where I came from, and in many ways it is, but it's not it's not nearly enough, honestly. It's not nearly enough. I think that's a very Anyhow, we fight on, girl, the two of us, for more Yes, kindness. we do. Yes, for more He's kindness and more compassion and more empathy 100%. and more love. Well, to, to end on it, because I've obviously, we've, I've, I've, I mean, it's absolutely flown by. I don't want to keep you too long, but what I do want to do is end it on a positive note. Yeah. I know I, I, I heard something about you planning on going to Korea at some point. That's right, yes. And, and John talks about, you know, go you've been to Vienna and you want to travel. What is, I mean, with John as well, but what is is next for Katie Morgan Davis? What's in the future? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, now with the lockdown, it kind of, and COVID, it kind of makes everything feel very in the air. But I, I want to travel the world, really. That's what I'm really interested in. Are you kind of yeah. reclaiming some of that? Um, yeah, rec rec obviously you've been kind of trapped into one place and you kind of reclaiming that grasp of the, yes. the freedom of the world by going yes. out there. That's right. And I wanted to be true to who I am and be, be myself. That's fantastic. And, I, you know, from speaking to you, I know full well that you and John, that, John is the one who's inspired me with that so much because he has gone through his own battles to be himself as well. So he always reminds me to be true to who I am. And that's the most important thing. And always be kind to everybody. That's fantastic. And I think that's a fantastic, really positive note to end on and a good message to end on. Um, thank you so but, much. No, but honestly, Katie and John, thank you so much for both of you speaking to me because I really do appreciate it and I appreciate it's a I, I mean it's your life it you know it, it's not a, a podcast or an article or anything like it. it's a story and it's your life story yeah. to, and I, I want to thank you for sharing it with me and you know I thank hope you, you get, so much and I do hope you get to Korea very very soon yeah thank you